Hi, I'm Dr. Mahesh. I'm frequently asked questions about sounds coming from a patient's jaw during routine activities involving mouth opening or closing. Some patients find the sounds intriguing, others annoying, but most have some level of concern. When there is associated pain, it can become devastating. These sounds have been described as a clicking, popping, cracking, or grinding noise. It is believed by researchers that around 15% of the general population has some level of joint noise. In the absence of understanding what is going on, this may cause a lot of needless stress, but ignoring it may lead to debilitating pain. Today, I hope to shed some light on what is likely happening in a lot of these cases. First, it is important for us to know some basic anatomy to understand why a jaw makes noise. The red arrow points to an easy to locate landmark. It's the ear canal. Just in front of that landmark is a green arrow that points to the jaw joint, also known as the TMJ, an abbreviation for temporomandibular joint. Many people associate TMJ with a disorder causing pain or popping and clicking in the jaw, but it's in fact just an abbreviation of the medical term for jaw joint. The jawbone or mandible goes down from the TMJ and forms a bend at the angle of the mandible, then proceeds out and forward to the chin and returns all the way around to the opposite joint. The lower jaw is the only moving bone in the body that is connected to both sides of the body, and thus movement of the jaw affects both jaw joints at the same time. Note that the teeth grow out of and are supported by the jaw. An important basic function of the lower jaw is moving the lower set of teeth away from and towards the upper teeth with enough force to crush food, chew, talk, and swallow. This occurs with amazing precision because it needs to do so without biting your tongue, lips, or cheeks. Teeth stop the jaw at the end of a chewing cycle, and the muscles and ligaments support and move the jaw. When the teeth are fully closed together, the jaw is seated like a tripod. The average person can generate about 162 PSI with the bite, so it's important to understand that 99% of the time, the upper and lower teeth are not intended to be touching. Instead, they are intended to contact only at the end of a chewing cycle. Tooth contact beyond that time is in fact undesirable and can be harmful. Prolonged contact is associated with bruxism or what is more commonly referred to as clinching or grinding. There are important chewing muscles outside of the jaw, known as the masseter temporalis, and also on the inside of the jaw, known as the medial and lateral pterygoid muscles. Our jaw is expected to serve a wide range of functions. It is necessary for the coordination of many muscles to facilitate movement of the jaw to enable such tasks as eating, talking, breathing, swallowing, yawning, yelling, and singing. Immediately anterior to the ear is the jaw joint. It's about the same size as your thumb knuckle. The TMJ is a unique joint. It has the ability to both rotate and slide forward and backward in and out of the socket. This allows the jaw to move forward and backward and side to side. Because the jaw can move in this unique manner, and the jaw joint is designed differently from other joints in the body. The jaw joint is a ball and socket joint, like many others, but it contains a third segment as well, a disc. The disc in the jaw joint is tough and flexible, it's white, and has a thin layer of lubricating fluid to make it slippery. It separates the ball from the socket, it's attached via ligaments to the ball like a saddle on a horse. Just as the girth strip keeps the saddle in place, the disc has ligaments that attach it to the ball. In turn, while the ball is sliding back and forth, the disc is riding on top of the ball, much like the saddle on a horse. In a normal mouth opening, the ball of the lower jaw rotates on the disc and then moves forward out of the socket and the disc follows it, providing a cushion-like effect, protecting the two bones sliding against each other along the upper and lower surfaces of the disc. If the ligaments supporting the disc have been elongated or torn, the disc becomes unstable and is easily displaced, causing it to make a sound as it pops into and out of place. The shape of the disc and the remaining muscle attachment may cause anterior displacement of the disc as the ball of the lower jaw moves back into the socket during a closing cycle. 
During an opening cycle, the ball of the jaw moves forward out of the socket and the disc is recaptured back into place, allowing for normal function from that point onward. This displacement and recapture of the disc during a mouth opening and closing movement is where the popping and clicking sound come from. Sometimes the ligaments are so elongated or damaged that the disc loses its ability to reseat and will not pop back into place on mouth opening. This usually is a progression from the less severe condition described earlier. The disc now remains stuck in an anterior position, resulting in an obstruction to opening fully, also known as jaw locking. Over time, the disc may adapt and some improvement in function may be noticed. Interestingly, the joint sounds may or may not have associated pain. This is because the disc and all other contacting surfaces of the joint are composed of fibrocartilage, which does not contain any nerves, and so there is no perceived pain even if the disc has become damaged or degenerated. In some cases, if the disc is anteriorly displaced and the ball of the jaw rests on the posterior vascular portion of the disc attachment, there can be significant pain and inflammation. Inflammation due to this condition can result in a degeneration of the disc and then you can hear a grinding noise called crepitus. This is the movement of the ball of the lower jaw against the socket without the cushioning effects of the disc, which has now significantly degenerated. When damage occurs to a joint, pain can originate in the remaining vascular tissues behind the disc, the ligaments, or the muscles. Patients may interpret this pain as an earache, headache, sinus tooth, jaw, or even neck pain. This may partially be a result of the uncertainty of the patient due to the proximity of the joint to these areas, or this may also be the result of a phenomenon known as referred pain from this region. The complex range of symptoms that is caused by TMJ disorders and its interrelationship with the anatomy of the head and neck can make treatment of this condition a multidisciplinary challenge. Involvement of other professionals to aid in the management of these conditions can be necessary, but if there is no pain and in the absence of other related symptoms, treatment may be minimal. Many times, these conditions will limit themselves and the joint will adapt to compensate for any damage. It is important to realize that the above explanation is only of the most common source of joint sounds. There is much value in having an experienced orofacial pain doctor evaluate your specific situation, as there are other conditions that can also create joint sounds, such as adhesions, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, spondylosis, disc perforations, and bone spurs, etc. While damage and pain from a displaced disc can be self-limiting over time, bone-on-bone -bone functioning can lead to the destruction of the jaw joint, causing further complications, the potential for increased pain and limitation of jaw function. You can find information on how to locate an orofacial pain doctor on the AAOP website.